Hello, everyone, and welcome to Over a Sunday. Five minutes of that. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> you guys with your self promotion and you, you young whippersnappers with the. <laughs> <laughs> the computers and the talking with the headphones. The... Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's what tonight's going to be like. So <laughs> it's April 10th, the year of 2020. So uh, we're it's April what? Oh, April the 10th. It's not quite tax day. It's not quite the uh -huh. day that the tax man is going to take all your money away. So let's put Jerry over here in the middle right there. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we're going to have a, a fun night tonight. We are going to ask Jerry all kinds of questions. And he assures me via email that he has none of the answers that we're going to uh, to the questions that we're going to ask. But we're going to ask him anyway. So uh, so I'm Roland and I'm here with uh, Curtis. Curtis, say hi. Hi. Curtis, hey to Curtis. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and uh, also with Thomas Floramonte Jr. Tommy, say hi. How do you do? Nice to meet you, nice to meet you too. Jerry. Have you ever Virtual. met Jerry? No, I have not. Oh well, Tommy, meet Jerry. Jerry, meet Tommy. <laughs> How's it do? Virtual handshake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and of course, uh, uh, our regular on, Roberta. Uh, Hi, Roberta. Uh, Roberta. <laughs> Roberta, say Hello. hi. He hi forgot there. your name. Don't you live no, in Florida no, now or something? No, no. Roberta didn't live California. in Florida. <laughs> And our Ooh. special guest tonight, you guys know him from doing comics for a long time. Uh, he's probably, I'm going to I'm gonna go out on a limb and say probably the most popular thing it was probably Batman, Son of the Demon. But Jerry's done a lot of stuff. He did a lot of Marvel 2-in-1, did some work for Marvel, uh, did work in Hollywood, which we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll ask you about that. And now he's uh, kind of a, a Western, I don't, is it a Western painter? Is that what you call yourself? Is that... I mean, you're a um, painter, but I, I do historical art. Historical art, okay, I, I like that. But uh, when people ask me, and, and I say, "Yeah, he kind of does historical paintings or, or uh, Western paintings now," and they're like, "Huh?" And I'm like, "You know who Frederick Remington is?" And they're like, "No." <laughs> and I, and I'm, I was always going to kind of like compare you to Frederick Remington. It's like he's kind of like Frederick Remington, but they're always yeah, like, yeah. "Oh, I, I wish." Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, I, I, I like your, I like your stuff. Of course, you already yeah. know that. Well, so. you know. Comparing me to the best, that's okay. <laughs> so I gotta ask you, Jerry, is, is this your first live stream? I know you've done interviews all over the place, but is this your first I've been in hiding. I, you know, the, you guys have dragged me out of this. You said, if you're my friend, you'll come on my website <laughs> podcast. And I go, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I think he's actually you said no to all of those, but I said Roberta really wants you to show up. And then I you did. said that was I it. Did oh, that. Was, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dropping the name. Uh -huh. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so, you no, know, I think, I, uh, I think uh, Rowan agreed not to keep begging you if you actually came on this one time. So we'll leave you alone <laughs> at this point. Yeah, well, after the one time, he won't want to be begging anymore. <laughs> yeah. Jerry has already asked me if we have the, one of those five second delay buttons. <laughs> oh, no. Uh oh. <laughs> right. Well, you know, you <laughs> well, I've lived alone for quite a while now. And I kind of, when I'm talking to, People in my family, you know, I sometimes slip into the <clears throat> the lingo that isn't polite for public. So, <laughs> no, no, I'm good. Okay. I'll, I'll manage. I'll, you know, virtually. Of course, you me. will. So, um, so the first time I met Jerry, now I don't know who Jerry was, but the first time I met Jerry was when he came into the Malibu offices around, and I don't know what year that was, probably 92? Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, maybe around there. Yeah, because I'd been there, I'd already been there for a while. And well, uh, I'm, trying, I'm trying to think, the, the my, uh, Beowulf graphic novel uh, came out in 94 thereabouts. And shortly thereafter, I got that uh, thing at the San Diego Comic Con, and I think I was work I was working at Malibu then, wasn't I? I don't know. Mm -hmm. You're there by then. I, I probably have it written down someplace. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was gonna say so. So Malibu uh, the, it ceased to be in what ninety six when was when uh, Marvel yeah. kind of fired everybody. Uh, the Mal mm -hmm. the Marvel purchase was in ninety four. Okay. So. Were you there before Marvel purchased Malibu? Well, the, uh, the 
the Kirby Award there was ninety. It was eighty. What was it eighty four? I, yeah. I don't know. It was the Beowulf was published in eighty four, and it was just a couple of years after that. I think I don't know. I'm, I'm too old to remember these things. You should remember it, Roland. Come on. <laughs> Curtis, you're the youngest one in the group. Come on. When was it? <laughs> what year was it? It had to be 90, 93, maybe? Maybe the beginning. How old, were, how old were you? Do you remember when I started working over there? I was 15 or 16. Um, and and okay. were you at, I, I can't remember. Were you at the uh, the Westlake Village office yeah. first? Yeah. yeah. So that, the, the, the first One of the first conversations I had with Curtis, I believe you were you were asking my my opinion on which martial art which martial arts you should take, right? And yeah. I don't, I don't know if you were you already into kung fu there or no, uh, no. I, I I wanted to go straight to the weapons. I said I want to learn how to use a sword, and you you just looked at me. And you said, you know, Curtis, they're not going to teach you how to use a weapon unless you know how to move your body. <laughs> <laughs> there is that too. Changes <laughs> your life, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, well, I was into jujitsu with it for quite mm -hmm. a few years and um it's good advice. the only sword that goes with that is if I, I i studied kendo for about you know for less than a year and you know it's the japanese styles you know i just moved from one to the next and, but uh kendo is quite a bit different from uh, kung, the, kung fu sword play <laughs> Roland, we'll start off with the bang. Roland said it was okay. I could say this live, so. Oh yeah, uh, please do. <laughs> so, so um, you know, Jerry was was such a huge influence on so many of us there, and, and he helped me with art and explained all and kind of put me on the right path. And he started a figure drawing workshop in this in the office. It was actually in the lunch area, and so Roland said it's okay. I can say that. So, so not only do I owe Jerry a lot because he helped me. Learn how to do art, but he helped me uh, see my first nude woman. So, so that's that's. Uh, what? Oh, 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 you had to bring that up. <laughs> and, and yes, I I brought in a model. Yeah, you know, a model once a week or whatever it was for I don't know how long until they somebody came by and said you can't be doing this here. Art, man. Curtis was like 13 years old. What are you doing? I just, I just remember I was staring at the ground for like the first 12 poses. Just you're right. You were staring at the ground. I don't believe that. <laughs> well, that's it's. It was just something I had done when I was at Imagineering, you know. And one of the guys over there, he brought in a model. You know, sometimes they were in costumes, sometimes they weren't. And you know, it was just one of those things, like artists after work and communing and learning and you know teaching each and, other and getting naked apparently <laughs> <laughs> you missed that part of being an artist tommy <laughs> i didn't know i didn't know i should have took more art classes i didn't yeah, know about that part of every, every art school class oh <laughs> dumb, God, i'm gonna sign up now let me see if i can take a class <laughs> there you go. i heard somebody oh, i don't know yeah. I don't remember who it was. I heard someone talk about it. They said that uh, they uh, every time they had a figure drawing class, they said, you know, you never knew. You, they, I guess they got around the stage and they said, you never knew where you would be in relation to the model. <laughs> but, but this person, <laughs> this person said it never failed. The dude would come in anytime it was a dude. He'd come in and he'd turn around and he'd face me. Why? Legs spread wide <laughs> open. And he'd be like, oh, can I move to the other side, please? <laughs> guess, guess what I'm going to draw. <laughs> okay. Okay, this is a PG podcast, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Roberta. It's okay. I went to art school, you know. Yes, I, well, yeah. I know. That's why I asked. Well, I know you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Everybody knows so, how uh, mm -hmm. Roberta started there at Malibu, right? Yep. You can yeah. tell it. Yeah, tell it. Go, tell it. I've already said. No, oh, okay. Yeah. It was all due to my moving into the neighborhood, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> I moved in in the middle of the night. All oh, it was just me and my uh, U-Haul van pulled into the house I was renting at the time, and my truck broke down right there in the driveway. Mm -hmm. And it was late. Lights were out, and I saw one across a light across the street, on kitty corner to my house. And I walked over there and I said, "Could I please use your phone?" And you know, Roberta and her mom were there. Oh, really? You never told us this story, Roberta. I didn't tell tell you this story because it's interesting. <laughs> and I yeah, was Roberta and her mom were there, and I found out that she was uh, going.
going to art classes at what was it north yeah um, northridge where was it northridge, northridge. yeah northridge, that's right and that's when i was when i started over at malibu and they were looking for computer colorists that's when Mm -hmm. Word was the first one that sprang to mind. How do I pay this family back for, <laughs> yeah. for helping me in the middle of the night with my broke down truck? <clears throat> At least letting me use the phone. So, yeah. Yeah. That, I'm, gl I'm that glad that I, you know, you've kept that a long time. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> ever, yeah. ever since we first met almost. I know it. I know it. And yeah. it was, it was really perfect because you know some of the classmates that i have were buzzing about that job too and i was like you know what this is perfect yeah. this is exactly what we need the impetus to you know get in by the way am i yelling here can you hear me yelling through okay maybe it's a family trait because we would get off the phone with my dad and it, Every, we would talk about it afterwards. You know, he, he always sounds when he's talking on the phone. He sounds like he's yelling into two tin, tin cans connected by a string. You know, and so that's why <laughs> I think I'm falling back on this. You know? <clears throat> this is weird technology where you actually just talk at a screen. Good lord. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And we've, I, you know, we've even got now the you, we've got the Dick Tracy watches. Uh, yeah, Dick Tracy watches. Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait till uh, they, they tell, wait till they tell you you have to implant them. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> or put them. I'm gonna put them in the back of my skull. Right, <laughs> yeah. Plenty of room, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. In my in my head, it is. Yeah. So, uh, all right. So, Jerry, what kind of what kind of training learning did you have uh, as an artist? Take us back to the the young days of. Oh, of Jerry. good lord! Oh, wait a minute. Think about that question. Curtis has just reminded me, I forgot to mention, I, in my excitement to get us started tonight, I forgot to mention our sponsors. Oh, so, yeah. Oh, yeah. Shout That's out to that. Daytona Beach Comic Con. If you like comics and you like uh, comic books and you want to meet comic creators, make your plans September uh, 10th and 11th, Daytona Beach Comic Con. There's going to be a whole bunch of silver liners there. I, I think my last count was 10 of us. There's going to be 10 of us there uh, and a whole bunch of other people who make comics as well. So come on out. And uh, make your plans at Daytona Beach Comic Con. Uh, also to or Orlando OCD, Orlando Collector Deviants. Uh, in fact, Wubba and I were on um, last uh, on Thursday. It was the first Wubba sighting in months. And Wubba assures me that he's going to be returning uh, to us soon. So hopefully uh, hopefully he'll, that'll be sooner rather than later. And of course, uh, big thank yous to Coliseum of Comics. They hosted me and Tommy and Haley on Friday, on uh, Wednesday when we did. Yeah, we had uh, a good time. We had a we had a fun time. We had a, a signing there for our new book, uh, Rejects, and uh, Coliseum of Comics, uh, East Colonial Drive in Orlando. If you are in Orlando and you want Silverline Comics, go there because they got a bunch of them. In fact, I'm going to get a. I took a picture. They got a rack that has a whole bunch of Silverline Comics, and uh, that was kind of a. That was really very cool to see. Can you and, share the picture? I, you know, no, because it's on the phone that I had, and I don't know Not how to do that. You don't know how to I do that. I don't know how to do that quickly. <laughs> he doesn't know how to do that. And, of course, uh, to uh, Kablam, <laughs> who is a printer, and they print all of our stuff. If you have an independent comic and you want your comic printed, you should reach out to Kablam. Okay. Thank you for reminding me of that, Curtis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, Jerry, back to the question. He's still like the office go-to go guy. <laughs> Perfectly. Very much so. Mm -hmm. Good job, Chris. <clears throat> Tommy, what is it you're doing there? You're working on you're working on a job right now, I can tell. Yeah. Oh, Tommy, Tommy, you want to share? Yeah. Sure. I'll throw it up. Well, drinker or what do you Yeah, yeah you can sure. I'll throw it up on the screen. Yeah. Give me give me a second. Let me get it worked up. So okay. one of the things we usually try to do here, Jerry, is uh, Roberta will often share her colors. Curtis will share his uh, his art. Tommy will ink, and we'll pop that up on the screen so that those who are watching us uh, visually can can watch one of these guys do some awesome work while we chat. So mm -hmm. uh, we we'll I've actually uh, watched a couple of your videos after you talked me into this thing, <laughs> 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 just to see what I was getting into. He, and, he, you know, you watched the one with Tom Mason, didn't you? Yeah, I watched that one. I, I, watched I knew you one. did because uh, because of the uh, 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 Archie, uh, not Archie. Um, oh crap, uh, Archie, Andy, yeah, Griffith. A a Andy Griffith. Thank you, Andy Griffith. Comment. Oh, yeah, made that Andy Griffith. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, okay, you you watch that one. 
No, Tom, uh, always articulate. I wish I could be as articulate, uh, speaking extemporaneously here. I, I am telling you, I still say today, uh, and we talk about this a little bit uh, offline, Tom is is one, uh, uh, is probably a person with the sharpest wit I think I have I have ever met. Um, he's so quick with his, uh, now often they're barbed when they come at you, mm -hmm. but, uh, he is so quick with it that, uh, you know, we used sure. to accuse him in our editorial meetings. We used to accuse him of going home and writing them down at night and then just memorizing them for the next day. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, um, he was, well, he, you know, it was, you, him, you know, you editors, you, you talk for a living basically. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I, I come here. I come here, and I uh, <clears throat> I spent forty to fifty years staring at my computer alone in a room, and <laughs> I can barely put a, string, a sentence together. So, you know, give me, give me some stuff. Well, you, you That's talk, what happened you talk. to me when Roland approached me for this stream. I'm like, I art. I don't talk. I I don't. <laughs> yes, you know. Yes, yeah. the way I feel usually. You know, it's a practice, practice skill, and I had no practice. <laughs> well, and it's funny too because uh, we were kind of talking about this the other day. If uh, if you look at some of the very first streams Roberta was on, she didn't say very much at all. No, nope. I mean she we and we we still do sometimes. Roberta, what do you think? We we specifically like, come out and uh, ask her, know. right? And uh, but but at the very first streams that she was like she's just like I, I want to draw put me on as if that would get her out of answering questions <laughs> well I've, I've known i've known a number of artists who are very good at uh, you know public speaking i was just never one of them yeah <laughs> cool stuff yeah now so, are uh, you the pencils too no, this is um, uh, Pete Clinton, which uh, usually is on our Sunday show, but I think he's probably still honeymooning uh, <laughs> or, or something. I don't know why he's not on. I think we saw him earlier today on the in the uh, in our big chat room thing, and so I think he's probably falling asleep. He's he's from uh, from the from UK, UK, so he's probably messed up his alarm clock and didn't set it. So. <clears throat> But uh, yeah, this is um, this is the fourth issue of Trump's uh, yeah the Pete's pencils and and I'm trying to trying to ink it. Very cool. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, it's, it's some good looking stuff. Yeah, you yeah. Know, some of us old guys from the '70s use "cool" way too often. It's just another thing I slip into on occasion when I'm talking. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think they held over into the '80s too. Yeah, we, we use that a lot. At least I don't use Nito in it much anymore. So, or what about Far Out? Far Out? No, I was never into drugs, sadly, or, or not. What? <laughs> so you had to be into drugs to say Far Out? Kinda. Was it? Back oh, in really? The 60s. Okay. Back in the sixties. Well, no, I'm just I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So back to the question, Jerry. <laughs> Where, 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 how um, do you attribute any of your artistic training? Did you go to school? Did you, uh, you know, I know you have some military service. Did you, did you do anything in the military? What, no, no, no. what, what was your training? What was your background? Mom. My mom. Your mom. Okay. Yeah. I, when I, when I was uh, one and two years old, I would be on her lap when she'd have the pencil in my hand saying, Eyes, nose, mouth, and she, we'd be drawing happy faces together, and so that was the start of it. Wow! <laughs> and you know, well, no, she did paint by numbers, and I was always intrigued. She was right. doing Disney paint by numbers, and and so I was kind of like steered toward that direction, just fascinated by it, until I got got I got my first comic books when I was maybe ten years old or something, and. Uh, then I just sunk myself into the comics. Got to trading with the kids on the block because God knows 12 cents was a little too much to spend back then in my neighborhood. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So then, then just, I was, you know, I was always a bit of an introvert. So I, I wasn't into sports. I was kind of a chubby kid. And so I would lay on my bedroom floor. My father used to throw me out of the house or tell me to get out and play. And I would just be in my room, laying on the floor, copying the pictures out of the comic books. And, and that's Nothing how, wrong with that. Well, you know, I, I've heard the story from other people. That's pretty much what it is. You, know, uh -huh. you, you love yeah. it. You start it when you're little and you just keep plugging it. 
And it's the frustration of not being able to draw like the guys in the comic books that keeps you want, wanting to evolve and, and make your stuff better. So it's, that's my young life. And then going from one comic book artist to the next as your inspiration, finding Jack Kirby and then moving from Jack Kirby to John Buscema. And I just, I fell in love with Buscema's work and I kind of tried to, tried to be him for many years, <laughs> influenced by a lot of others. There, the great thing about comics back then was Marvel Comics. There may have been a house style, but there were such, there were such disparate talents, such so many different styles in house. You yeah. know, from Kirby to Gene Colan, it's like they're they're miles apart. And Gil Kane and all these guys came from someplace else and brought their own talent. And that's 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 what I think so many of the young people miss today. They're all trying to look like. Uh, the present day comics are not all, but you know, so many of them. Right. And uh, I think it hurts the company. You know, it's what the company aims at. You know, when I finally started talking to people at the companies, I got, okay, I got out of the service in 76. And I, for four years while I was in the military, I was, re I was renting a house off base for much of it. And I built myself a drawing table out of a giant sheet of particle board and two by fours. I hammered it together, <laughs> nail, nail. Wow. And, and so I had this huge drawing table in my in the spare room. <clears throat> and every day I got off work, I where I was a policeman, so I was mostly, you know, swing shift, midnight shift. And so mornings I would spend hunkered over that table and trying to. And I, over the case of four years, I drew. Well, I probably wrote three novels and I drew this comic book character that I, you know, I claim I invented <laughs> and it was like 90 some pages. And I thought, wow, this is going to get somebody's attention. And so I, I, I walked out the gates of the base for the last time in New Jersey and I went to New York and nobody wanted to see my comic book. <laughs> I was just, and I was devastated. It's like I put my whole life into, and now I got to go find a job. <laughs> so I, you know, I think I would, I don't know how old I was, 21. Oh, no, no, no. I, 22 or thereabouts. And I, you walk, walk me Manhattan in the summer heat, dripping, with you carrying your portfolio. And from Port Authority to Madison Avenue and back. And, <clears throat> and I, at some point I stopped and I, we'd had phone books though in those days, phone books. Yeah. And I found one with a phone, phone book in it. And I tore the pages out that were <laughs> art directors and not art directors, but like publishing companies. And I found out where Mad Magazine was. And I oh, found cool. out where, you know, all these other companies were and even advertising companies. And I walked in and it was, you know, do you have an appointment? Oh, do I need an appointment? <laughs> and then walking, I, you know, I, I must have been walking for 10, 12 hours. I don't know. Great. It was just, it was miserable, hot and sweaty. And, and I went home and I collapsed and I believe I cried that night thinking my life was over. Right. My whole life I had geared towards comic books. This is all I ever wanted to do from the time I was, 10 years old and I got, you know, I finally got out of the military and every, I was ready for my shot and nobody let me take a shot. <laughs> so, uh, I went home. Yeah. And I was, you know, I was devastated. I couldn't move for about a day or two. And then yeah. I said, hey, what are you gonna do? Go drive a cab. So I, so I opened my sketchbook up and I started drawing on the floor again. Actually it was uh, my first wife. I was at right out of the service, it was in New Jersey, so I was able to stay at her house and and spend uh, my days there on her carpet, drawing, <laughs> drawing <clears throat> more and more characters and stuff. And eventually, well, I kept going back to Marvel. Actually, I, I found uh, Frazetta's name in the in a phone book, and I called, and I boy, I didn't get a warm welcome there. <laughs> <laughs> I said, "This is the one guy I ever wanted to meet." And no, I, you know, 
<laughs> they didn't want to see me. I guess other people had found Frazetta too. I thought I was the only one. <laughs> I, you know, back then, I knew nothing about Comic Cons. I, I, you know, yeah. I was isolated in my little world, and I thought I was the only one trying to do comic books. So, anyhow, well, back, so, yeah, in, back in the day, that's how you found the information. You got the phone book. That's right. Got the phone book or something. Yeah, I didn't. I had bought a couple of fanzines or, or got them from a friend at some point, so I knew what fanzines were. But I, you know, I had I had no idea what I was going up against. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and so that that was it. And uh, I started. I kept drawing for about six months or so, or not so much. Maybe three or four months, just redrawing stuff and and creating a whole new portfolio. And I went back to Marvel maybe three more times. And the art, and finally, I, you know, I made appointments and the art director, Marie Severin. Mm. Uh, first, first, I think the first guy who looked at my portfolio was maybe Denny O'Neill. Oh, wow. At that point. And, uh, and he gave me some advice and sent me home. And then Marie Severin was the art director there at Marvel. And she would meet me in the lobby and she came out and she had these, she had full size Xeroxes of the pencils that she gave me to take home. And it was just like, this was a gift from the gods. Right. I, had, I had pencils from Gene Colon and Andrew, oh. Ross, and, uh, Ross Andrew, Andrew, uh -huh. and the Spider-Man stuff. And, and I had all these different pencilers, Xer the Xeroxes of their pencils. And man, I just, I said, I'm never going to be able to do this. These guys are great. Look at this. You know, when you see large comic book drawings for the artwork yeah. for the first time, yeah. it's a revelation. Because it you know, really when, is. when you're growing up and you're trying to learn from looking at these little comic book pages, and then you see the original art full size for the first time as an adult, mm. it's like you know somebody slapped me in the head with a broom and said, what are you doing here? <laughs> 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 Yeah, so that that was really eye open, and then so I went back, and Marie saw me once or twice more, and and the last time she sat with me and looked over my new samples, and she said, you know, there's this there's this guy over in New Jersey, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Dan Atkins, and I mm -hmm. said, no, I hadn't. <laughs> he was like <clears throat> a famous inker that I never really paid much attention to because I was always interested in the pencilers. Uh -huh. I had never tried to ink anything. And uh, yeah, so Dan Atkins, he, he told me, I, I made an appointment, I went over to his house, him and Jeanette, his wife, and uh, his apartment he was staying at in New Jersey, right across the river from New York. <clears throat> and he let me stay on his couch for a week. That's he had a second, cool. second drawing table set up in his living room. And I drew on his drawing table in the living room, and he would tell me I would never make it. <laughs> wow. he, would, he, would say, he would say, Bingham, you're not going to make it. He says, he was look when you were going to get out? Is that what he was doing? He, he says, look at John Buscema here. Look, look at Frank Frazetta. Back when Frank Frazetta was a teenager, he could, he could sell his work today. Look how great he was in when he was 19 and 20. And I say, yeah, I know, I can't, I'll never do it. <laughs> Eventually, you know, we got some samples drawn up that he thought uh, were passable. And uh, he took the bus with me over to Manhattan and took me in to Marvel and showed wow. my stuff there. And Archie Goodwin, um, my hero, the best editor ever in the comic book industry, one of the great, one of the best writers in comics ever. If you know the Warren stuff that he did and, and, and after, and uh, the guy is, the guy was a legend. I knew Archie Goodwin's name. And uh, he gave me a trial story <clears throat> and 10 page story. And I went home and I drew the 10 page story and took it in and he put it in a drawer and he said, very nice. And we never saw it again. And then, <laughs> and then, and then, and, but he did give me another tryout, uh, Kazar story. And my, my stuff, you know, I look at the stuff I was doing then and I say to my, and I tell other people, I say, I wouldn't have hired me. <laughs> this was terrible. <laughs> this was awful. And, uh, but he gave me another tryout 
and I went home. It was a Kazar story. And that went in a drawer. And about five years later, when I was when I was working in the business regularly, trying to make a name for myself, trying to improve every day, they printed that story. Somebody else inked it, and they made a joke comic out of it. Oh, no. Oh, you know, the bad guys were wearing modern watches, and eating po- there's the people in the, in the stadium stands were eating popcorn, and, you know, they just humiliated the hell out of me. <laughs> Oh man! And it was it was excruciating when I, I I you know I got my monthly comic books in the mail from them and I saw my book and I saw the cover and I said wow I, they printed this and I opened it up and I said what the hell is this Oh man! <laughs> half the book was half the book was redrawn in in the office I take it you know because the the redrawing wasn't all that swift and but they did that to me a lot back then. Really, um, the Marvel the editors, they, you know, they didn't like my my work for the most part, and so they, well, would always hand my stuff over to uh, somebody in the office or whatever artist yeah. had stopped by for the afternoon and told them to redraw a certain pain. I half of the books that I did at Marvel, I would say, maybe maybe not half, but I would say at least my first five years working there, I I didn't recognize half the books when they came out because wow. at least half the books were redrawn. And that was frustrating yeah, <laughs> oh, for a guy who's trying to build his own ego while he, while he knows he's not very good at it, you know, and tr- trying to make a name for himself. I, and that was uh, one of the reasons uh, I taught myself to paint. Mm. I said, if I'm not going to do this. I'm going to be Frank Frazetta and I'm going to be on book covers. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. so, uh, it was about you know, six or seven years after I had started at Marvel. I had also started working at DC. I should I should put that in. Um, at I, they had their tryout books when I was that age. They were the anthology series, the House of Mysteries, House of Secrets, Our yeah. Army at War, those kind of things. And so I did several of those uh, uh, House of Mysteries or whatever they were. And uh, I was doing that. And meanwhile, I was working. Uh, Dan had moved from New Jersey to a house in Reading, Pennsylvania, to be close to his buddy, Jim Steranko. So I got to meet Jim Steranko, who, you know, he's a god among comic book artists. <clears throat> and a uh, very nice guy. And um, yeah, that's why Dan moved to Reading, Pennsylvania. And he, asked, he, he moved into a, uh, a three-story Victorian-style house. And, and he took the top floor, the top couple of floors, and then he said, the bottom floor is vacant. And so I said, you betcha. And I moved in <laughs> downstairs. <clears throat> and moved downstairs of him, set up down there. And I still wasn't getting regular work at that time. Yeah. And so, and I had never picked up a quill pen, I had, a dip pen. I, I had never even tried to use it. And at that point in Dan's career, he had slowed down quite a bit. He had, he had his own um, problems, not being able to maintain focus or a schedule or anything. And so <clears throat> he asked me to help him ink this giant size book drawn pencil by Jose Garcia, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. Lopez, yeah. Uh, the bat, the, it was Superman versus Wonder Woman. Cool. And... Yeah. I was so intimidated, despite never having picked up a quill pen, <laughs> but he, he asked me to help him ink backgrounds, you know, the chain link fence back there or oh, some yeah. of the rubble, rubble falling off of a building that's collapsing and stuff like just to move the pages along for him. And uh, he took me in when he delivered the pages. He took me in there. Joe Orlando was the editor in chief. Mm. And uh, he took the book in there to Joe Orlando and Joe Orlando looked through the pages and I'm standing in the doorway and he says to Dan, he says, did he help you with these? And I nodded and Dan, Dan said, yes. He said, don't do it again. Oh. <laughs> oh. There you go. Bingham gets his ego stroked one more time. Oh. <laughs> oh. Uh, Joe, Orlando. <laughs> Joe Orlando was a nice guy. And I eventually started getting work there just on the, you know, that's when I started getting work on the uh, anthology books and stuff. But yeah, that was uh, another experience. I've got a ton of these stories of big <laughs> failures. 
<laughs> as we incrementally move up the chain and try to, trying to, trying to be a real artist. I, I have a question, Jerry. I mean, was, so, I mean, obviously they were, they were pretty harsh, you know, on you, but was that, how much of that was hazing? How much of that was just that? No, no, I wasn't very good. I, I admit, you know, every time I, I bring it up or talk about this stuff, it was, I was, my stuff was really immature. And all I all I knew is you know my own uh, uh, feeble attempts at being other pencilers at the time, and so um, that's that's where I was, and I can understand why a lot of my books were redrawn by other artists uh, mm -hmm. in in places, and you know my perspective was crap and or whatever, and I'll, and there are inkers who will say that today too, and they better not because I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> no, <clears throat> no, I, I understand. I know I, one thing I, I, one thing to my advantage is I know where I stand in the universe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when, when Roland Mann mentions Remington, I know where I am on that food chain. <laughs> 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 and I kind of knew from the start was it when I was doing comics, I was never, well, it became, um, it also became something that held me back it was my own dislike for my own work. I, should, or I don't know how to put it, but uh, I never liked my own work. And to this day, paintings that I'm doing now, all I can see are, well, not all I can see. I can see the paintings that are more successful than others. I can, I can see what I've done right, but there's, I, I can't look at a painting of mine where I don't see what, what I've done wrong. Wow. And that, that has come with me from childhood. And wow. yeah, and it's been like, and like I said, my early days in comics, it was beaten into me. Dan Atkins, he'd say, Jerry, you're never going to make it in this, in this business. He says, you have beady eyes and, and nobody likes a guy with beady eyes. I said, it's genetics. I can't do anything. <laughs> I don't remember that. He used to call me Bingham. 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 <laughs> Bingham. <laughs> <laughs> look at yeah. look at his son's work. This is yeah. wonderful. He was like this his whole life. Yeah. Okay. JD Korea says every artist is their worst critic. You <laughs> that, yeah. Hello, JD. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> JD's a buddy. Okay, very cool. Thanks for <laughs> jumping on, JD. Ask ask any questions that you want Jerry to answer here on this yeah. live stream. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And anyhow, yeah, so that's um yeah, that's where my artistic life came from. Well, uh, hey, here's a here's a name I recognize. Oh yeah, <laughs> we are our own worst. Yeah, Phil. Yeah, mm -hmm. now go ahead and criticize me, Phil. Go ahead, so see. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Phil, Phil's my younger bro. He's okay. He's pretty cool. <clears throat> uh, yeah, JD says he's doing fine, Jerry. A good deal. Good to hear. <sighs> so. Okay, so that's where, that's where I was in Pennsylvania with Dan Atkins and his family living upstairs, me downstairs, listening to all his uh, weird stories. Man, I got stories out of that guy. <laughs> you never know quite what to believe, but he was always entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But he was, he was so good to so many artists. I mean, he took me in downstairs he said you know it wasn't his apartment it wasn't his building but you know he got me the room downstairs and i was there for as long as i wanted to be oh, and wow uh, that was maybe about three or four years before i found a place up in the Poconos where i can just be away in the in the, in the woods <laughs> <clears throat> a nice little place i could rent for myself yeah but dan but you know i got nothing bad to say about dan he's he helped a lot of people out uh greg russell uh, Val Merrick, oh, okay. so, so many names in the business who came out of, of Dan helping them. At one time, he even you know he even told me that Jeff Jones spent a week on his couch, <clears throat> and of course went in a different direction. And uh, but I'm trying to think who else. Uh, <clears throat> but, so he was the guy who had a reputation right. for basically taking artists under his wings and critiquing yeah. them for a bit. Well, he got his big break by becoming Wally Wood's apprentice. Oh, back in the oh day. okay. And uh, of course, I, he had some, some bad times with Wally. <clears throat> and he, he claims that he was there when Wally committed suicide. <clears throat> oh, my goodness. Wow. So it wasn't, it wasn't all fun and games back then. But Dan, you know, 
got got through that and and made a hell of a name for himself in the comics business as a, one of the best anchors in the business, basically. And uh, yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, I, I just remember, he came back. He came back from one trip into New York, turning in his. You know, <clears throat> after a while, he he had a real rough time with deadlines, and wow. he went in. He kept going into Jim Shooter and, and begging. He said, begging, I will get it done this time. I promise. And he, and he went in after having his 10 page job for about uh, a month. And he went in, into the office and he came back and said, Bingham, he said he was going to throw me down the elevator. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if he actually said that to him. This is, this is Dan talking now. So, but like I said, Dan was always entertaining. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, whatever that was that. So, and so, what the, a, in the meantime, because I was, you know, always struggling with the uh, with the comic book art. I never, like I said, I never liked my own stuff. That's when yeah. I started painting, and uh, <sighs> I got I got did maybe a dozen or two dozen paperback covers for uh, Pinnacle Books. Was it? Oh, science fiction, you know, it, the, the, the business, just every aspect of the illustration world throws me at some point. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I went in, I hit, I doing these science fiction series, bad, bad science fiction series covers. <laughs> uh, and um, one was these lawless worlds. And it was about this uh, woman who's a, this gorgeous, judge in the universe who goes around with their sidekicks or whatever and it's it's sort of like soft porn or something is what it was <laughs> so but in the one cover i you know i had uh you know she's on the cover and there was a unicorn in the story so i drew you know a horse with a spike on the head and 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 the, you know i painted the whole thing up everybody thought it was nice and i went home and I, I called I called them up and I said, you know, do you have another genre? It, they didn't have work for me, more science fiction work. So I said, well, give me, you know, how about a Western? And, and he said, well, can you draw horses? I said, I, it's right there on your desk. It's a unicorn. <laughs> it's a horse with a bike on his head. <laughs> but he didn't like my attitude when I said that. <laughs> so I guess I think that was close to the, my end there. <laughs> but this is this is the turns of the illustration world as I was going through it. You know, so. Right there on your desk. <laughs> <laughs> it's a horse. It's got a horn. I can take the horn off. Uh, uh, I never knew how these art directors thought. I could never. I can never, never second guess them. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Maybe it was a nice way of saying, Jerry, we just don't like your painting. I don't. <laughs> and, <laughs> anyhow. That's where that is, and then I yeah. was I was bouncing back and forth from Marvel to DC, and finally, um, well, I was doing I was working at Marvel when I decided I had been my pencils had been butchered way too much from other <clears throat> anchors, and I was I was almost never there was a couple anchors that did an okay job, but I was almost never happy because they would inevitably redraw all my work and it looked nothing like I had put on paper. Hmm. And so that it's was be frustrating. That was when they could. That was when the anchor they gave me had any competence at all. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to name names. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we we try to only name the ones that we really like. Live. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, where was I going with that? And, yeah. So that that's when I decided I needed to do some stuff on my own, and I did. Uh, I kept wanting to get a job on Conan, so I was doing barbarian women portfolios, mm -hmm. and that's when I. And but because I always, I always had this love of English literature. That's when, at some point, I decided I was going to do my own graphic novel, and I chose Beowulf, and I, uh, <clears throat> I hadn't inked much, and so I, I basically had four or five anchors that were very different on my drawn table pinned up there. And I was stealing technique like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> <laughs> the Europeans, because yeah, I had discovered the European artists like oh. uh, Jean Giraud, Mobius, right. and, uh, <clears throat> and Victor De La Fuente. I was in love with this guy's work. That was just this, he had this wonderful scribble line that he used 
and you could just the competence in this guy was just it was visceral you know, the way he inked and uh, I just I bought everything his I could find and this guy just floored me and I want and so when I was developing my own inking style I didn't I couldn't be like him. I didn't have that kind of confidence with the, with the tools, but I did in include these little squiggle lines in there in my own inking, <clears throat> and uh, it developed something of my own style with that. And then that, I, I say my style is a common, my ink style was a combination of uh, Victor De La Fuente, Mobius, uh, Dick Giordano, because wow. he was doing a lot of the Neil Adams stuff at the time, and so I had all you know these different anchors that I was swiping from constantly stylistically. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so <clears throat> that's one that's, I was still working at Marvel when I did the uh, AO Frafic novel. And right. I remember taking it in there and, and Jim Shooter looked at it and he said, it's nice. It looks like uh, Prince Valiant. I said, okay. So I went home <laughs> and I took it someplace else. And then, I, <laughs> and then I took it someplace else. And then eventually, um, First comics, they said we'll publish it if you do it, ten issues of Warp because we lost our penciler on Warp, uh -huh. and that's the last thing I wanted to do. I said if I will, if you can publish, if you will publish this, promise to publish this, I will do Warp, and that's that's how I got Beowulf published. And then everybody <laughs> who rejected me when I was shopping it around, I, I guess they all voted for me during the award ceremony. <laughs> the comic <laughs> count. But I, you know, I had no idea anybody else even liked it. <clears throat> but uh, huh. so that's well, that's where that came from. Well, sometimes was, don't you think you got to do the thing that you like, and and yeah. that's uh, people. I think people will gravitate towards that. Well, I, I knew nothing of these characters at first comics, and so yeah, you, know, you have to have some sort of a feeling, some kind of affinity for the characters, and <clears throat> it's it's hard to stay that long on a book. You. I wasn't even reading the books. I was just reading the descriptions and drawing those comic books. <laughs> I, I never read a script. But that, wow. was, that, was more, that was most of my time in comics. I very seldom read a full script. I was, I was reading the descriptions of the panel by panel. Right. Especially the DC stuff because every panel was described in detail. Yeah. Marvel stuff you had to read because Marvel, the way the Marvel writing style worked, it was the writers would make a rough pass. It's almost like a treatment. Right and then hand it off to the artist and then the artist would do his thing and then it would go back to the writer and he would add his own bits of story and dialogue around that. Right. But DC was different. This, the dialogue was all written. The, the, the boxes were all, were all described in detail. So I didn't really have to read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't did know you how much dialogue was in a, was in a square. So I could right. had that much room to leave. Yeah. I wasn't always successful at it. <laughs> but do you, do you have having having done both of those? Do you have a preference a, as an artist? Well, the preference now is just to work on my own stuff. But well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I really, you know, I, it's hard for me to fall in love with anything new in comic books. <clears throat> I, yeah, it's hard for me to to stay in love with anything old the way that these characters have turned out over the years. Yeah, uh, we won't go into that part. Right. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm uh, as far as like the methods go. If you if you were to sit down and, and uh, do something not your own today, which of those uh, and, and you can give pros and cons. That's fine. Which of those methods do you think you prefer? Um, well, I I like having some say in the direction of the story because there's too many writers in the business who are not visual. Yeah. And and. I worked a long time with a few with a few of them, where <laughs> I'd say nine panels on a page, right. and all this dialogue, and you're introducing three new characters, and I have to create <laughs> costumes for these characters that you're going to see maybe a quarter of an inch tall in a panel. <laughs> yes, yeah. and I, you know, now nowadays, or not, not everybody, but a lot of the books. If, that I don't buy. I flip open and, and it's all these large splash panels. And it's all you see is, you know, the two panels on a page, three panels on a page, characters all showing, they're all like poster shots. Right. And, uh, I keep saying all, I'm generalizing. Of course. There are, there are a few that I really like, but for the most part. The Silver Line books, of course. Of course, everything <laughs> Silver Line does. Is, I love this stuff. <laughs> 
<laughs> Especially Roberta's coloring. My gosh. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I, I never under well, you know, look at you look at Watchmen. Dave Gibbons did nine panels a page, ten panels a page. I said, you know, I'm, he, and God bless him for it. I, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> and yeah, I, I love the guy's work, but I'm not, I can't do nine panels, baby. Yeah. <clears throat> so anyhow, yeah. And then in, in, in one book I worked on, I, I kept questioning the physics of. But to draw something, you have to understand the physics of what's going on in the in the frame, and when. Yeah. Okay. I won't go. There. <laughs> <laughs> or what, how can how can I get out of this now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so so uh, Tommy and Roberta, either one of y'all have a uh, question? I have a comment. How about a okay, comment? Okay. Comment. Go ahead. Yeah. So so Jerry, you know, you got you got me early, where I was still trying to figure out how to be an artist, and I I think that. Mm -hmm your history was was so rich and so uh, Im impressively difficult that you know i just had that steel that that needed to happen that i i'm going to keep pushing mm -hmm. and i wanted to say thank you for all of that because you know it's yeah, scary to be an artist it. as it is but to see that you can come out of that no. Yeah. It's, <clears throat> I think it's one of <laughs> for me, it was all, well, I'll show you. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was basically me, me yeah, always walking yeah, around with a spine and uh, because I, you know, my, my father was a working class guy. I always say he's the hardest working man I ever knew. I mean, he from construction, whatever he did. And, and so I cannot fault him for his thinking. Right. But for him, the thought of me trying to be an artist was just, I was destroying my life. You know, how yeah. could, you know, you have to have something to fall back on. I can get you on the fire department because of this, you know, and, and I just, <laughs> so when I was a kid, grown, when I was a kid and I graduated from high school and I wanted to go to the American Academy of Art downtown and I worked all summer on a beer truck to get into the American Academy of Art and I screwed off most of it. Most of the time, I was in class. I, yeah, I just wasted that year there. Uh, <laughs> Eventually, that's what, and when I didn't want to go back to work on a beer truck, that's when I signed up for the military. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, yeah. But this is the mindset I grew up with. My dad, you know, the laborer, the hardest working guy I ever knew. He could not understand that all I wanted to be was an artist. Yeah. And, you know, at some point, you know, you're going to be living in doorways. You know, and he was, you know, he was really. And so that's why I had to pay for my own art schooling. I had a friend of family helped me out and we, you know, we figured out other ways for me to do it for the year. But uh, that set something in my brain that said, I'm never going to give up. Um, yeah. and this is something that, you know, I want to do since I was an infant almost. And so there was no falling back on anything. You know, you yeah. got to have something to fall back on. A lot of parents say that. And I just, I could not, nothing in me could accept that. I would get angry at the thought of yeah. being, when I went to start working with Dan Atkins, you know, and he's telling me, you know, we're, you know, Jer, he's looking at my work, you know, Jer, they say that, uh, you know, they're across the country every year, Hundreds of thousands of artists come out of these art colleges and art schools across the country, and they go to two places. They go to New York and Los Angeles, and you're not going to make it. <laughs> this is what Dan Atkins told me. And so going from my dad to Atkins, and it was hearing much of the same thing, he, and yeah. he'd say, you know, there's nothing wrong with driving a cab. There's nothing wrong with it. You, you know, you, you should be, you know, and I just, I would just, I would just, I would blank all them out, and I, I just, I had tunnel vision at that point. There's nothing anybody could say, even after I went to work and was getting all this, you know, everybody hating my work at the companies. You know, I just say, I'll, you know, I went home in the back of my head, 
I can improve this. I've been improved. I can, I could look at my old stuff. I could see improvement and I, and I would work to improve. And I, I tell the story my first couple of years there at Marvel, I probably spent more time erasing pages than I did drawing them <laughs> because I hated my, work, my own work. Wow. I just, it was almost to a point where it's not like I had uh, artist block where I couldn't work. Mm. No, I had, I just couldn't look at my work. And so I would, <laughs> yeah, that's it too. Yeah. Philip says, yeah. maybe you didn't want dad to say, I told you so. <laughs> 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 that too. <clears throat> I was, I got his uh, stubborn Irish streak. <laughs> so, but yeah. And so I would, I did a lot of erase in those first few years. I, I was always able to get a deadline met. Um, but it, it spent, it was 10, 12, 14 hours a day sometimes at the drawing board. And, yeah. uh, yeah. Those are long Good hours. Work. Yeah, well, well, I've done it other places, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bobby Wiskowitz says, hello, big dummy. Share all on Facebook at home. Uh, Bobby. Hello, oh, Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> what's up, Screw Loose? Uh, in case you didn't know, Jerry, he calls me big dummy. That's my father-in-law. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, yeah, so thank you for that. Um, so that that's uh, that's that's pretty cool. Um, Did I fill the hour? Is it time to go home? <laughs> no, not yet. Not yet. There, there, there's no, and still... I have some Hollywood questions on how. You yeah, I was gonna say we still got all the questions here. Well, I, I, I want to ask a question about uh, you working at Malibu with uh, uh, with with these these guys. Whenever we have somebody that uh, that was actually in the office over there. Tell me some uh, embarrassing things that you remember <laughs> from these guys. Because you know, I was I only mean, there one day a week. But the thing I remember most is I kept uh, the fact that you Curtis, you were doing nude models in front of Curtis when he was thirteen. <laughs> besides that, what? Uh, Curtis, how old were you? Nine, eight, uh, four and a half. No, <laughs> four and yeah, 15, and a half. fifteen. I think fifteen. I was there from fifteen to eighteen. I think. Yeah. Yeah, my so. time at Malibu, it, well, it was like, it was like I said, it was only one day a week I was in there just fixing up stuff and talking to the art, the colors about color and stuff. <clears throat> um, yeah, the thing I remember most about Malibu is I kept seeing headlines on the, on the news about mailmen going into the office with automatic weapons. And I, I thought to myself, you know, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. I have no, no Not at all. <laughs> Basically, at Mal my time in Malibu, I don't have a lot of really embarrassing stories because I, I usually just, when I wasn't talking to the colorists, we had our meeting there once a week where hmm. we talk about computer color and that sort of thing. Um, I usually just went in my corner and sat at the drum board and did whatever somebody, somebody slides something across my desk and say, this is what we need. And so I really wasn't, uh, I didn't work on a book, I don't think, did I? Mm. Oh, yeah, I did the, well, I did the Deep Space Nine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I've already talked to Roland about this, so I'm yeah. not Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so you, you, that was more of a consulting kind of role, wasn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. That's, that's yeah I don't remember what your exact, what your specific title was. Art consultant. consultant. Art consultant, yeah. Something like that. I, I do I do remember that you you talked with all of the artists because you know we had the kind of the of a bullpen there but we had the coloring department mm -hmm. and then we had guys in there who uh, who did inks and we had color guides on staff and we had letters mm -hmm. um, the only thing we didn't have was an on staff penciler uh -huh. you know well I did, I did some lettering while I was there I had some logos and uh, and then uh, right. I also there was a time when I was uh, I remember drawing some pages for other artists that didn't get in on time, like George Perez and uh, was it yeah. Edwin Smith was doing Rune. And so oh, yeah. I, I did a few pages on those books. Um, but I, like I, said, I, I spent so little time in the office, I really didn't, you know, do that much of it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I, I was also, <laughs> yeah, Jerry, you're, you're such a, you're such an old curmudgeon. Well, at the time, <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I had just gone through my first hip replacement. <laughs> yeah. I spent, I spent, you know, was it uh, when I was 30, 
the osteoarthritis started to get me bad because of all the martial arts I was doing. And so by the time I hit 40, it was, it was, it was around 1990. It was the year of the Northridge earthquake mm. that I had my first hip replacement. But I was, I was in such pain for years before that, <clears throat> that, uh, yeah. So that's I, I, when you guys met me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I actually remember, uh, you had, uh, uh, a hip gate that um, when you walked around the office, you could tell that your, your hip was hurting often. Yeah. Uh, you I had, you had one of those you know, uh, hip. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure somebody knows because that before I had the surgery, well, the doctor at UCLA, the surgeon at UCLA, he just, I said, when will I know that I, and he says, you'll, you'll know when to have the surgery because you will not be able to do anything without it. Yeah. And that's, that's what happened eventually. I couldn't walk the length of a parking lot. I was wow. in such excruciating pain. This, but to describe it, you know, this is getting maudlin. Should I continue? <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 well, they just to get, get this over with. When, you, when you've got that osteoarthritis in your hips, it feels yeah. like your nerves feel like you have broken glass in your hip joint. Wow. And that's what it feels when, and it gets worse. And so eventually this feeling of broken glass on the nerves in between the, the ball joint of your hip, if it you just can't do without it, and so that's when I finally, 1994 North Northridge earthquake. Yeah. That's when I finally said, you know, I got no choice. I can't walk to my car, you know. So, so that's what that's what that was. Anyhow, wow. let's, yeah. let's, so let's get happy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you feel better today. <laughs> so what would you say? You know, you got to go into, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who dream and imagine and uh, uh, I guess maybe fantasize about being able to go into the Marvel offices. Certainly, um, certainly in the days of the 70s and 80s. I don't know that people dream about hanging out at the Marvel offices so much today. Maybe they do. I don't know. But uh, there, there, there's. Are know, they allowed? <laughs> I, I don't know. I doubt it. Uh, it's in California, so I doubt it. Um but you know, there's a lot of um, there's a you know, there's a lot of people that you hear. Oh, I'd love to have been able to you know wander around the office and you know and see uh, the bullpen and and you know Ramita's uh, uh, Raiders and all that kind of stuff. You got to do it. What what are what are a couple of the highlights from from doing that? So you, you kind of told the the everybody hated Jerry's art stories. <laughs> what? <laughs> What are well, the? I guess they all didn't hate it because I did keep getting work. Yeah, you kept. That's what work. I was going to say. Yeah, you were. They didn't tell you not to ever come back. Yeah, so so yeah. something was going right. Well, yeah, they they kept paying you to do work, so so they didn't. Well, all eventually, hate you. eventually the work became. Um, try to think back. After a while, Marvel. They kept passing me around. Um, mm. It got to, it, I couldn't stay on a book for very long because I was being bounced from Marvel team up to Marvel two and one. And I do a couple books here and a couple books yeah. there. And I kept asking for my own book. Right. And <clears throat> nobody, none of the editors would give me one after a certain point. And so, and then I saw a new artist come by. Frank Miller came in the office and immediately took over Daredevil and all, oh, and more power to him. I got the guy who was great and he impressed the hell out of me, the stuff him and Klaus Chance was doing on his book. So I, I got, I can't complain about that, right? But I, I always thought that you know, there had to have been a book they could have given me somewhere that I could have made my own. <clears throat> and I, I realized my stuff when I started out was very immature, my drawing. Um, but towards the end, there I was getting better, and uh, I still never got what I wanted, so I had to walk. I, I went over to DC, and that's when <clears throat> I talked to a few people there, and uh, I was like, oh, the the by that point, the uh, Beowulf graphic novel was out, and I had gotten some name recognition off of that. And uh, I'm trying to put this in some kind of chronological order here. <clears throat> I went to went to DC, and oh, I know what it was. Um, I was I had done those little two page stories, filler stories for the anthology books, and I opened a comic reader because I knew what fanzines were at that point. Right. I the comic reader, and I, I saw that Mike Barr had <clears throat> signed 
to write the first Batman graphic novel. Oh. And, and all I knew of Mike Barr was I drew a little two page story with him in one of those anthology books, but I got his phone number. I called him up and I said, do you have an artist yet? And he said, not yet. And I said, how about it? And he said, yeah, okay. And so he passed <laughs> oh, my name, that was passed easy. My name along and uh, history was made as they say. <laughs> Well, so so Son of the Demon was your first DC work? Not my first. Well, while I was working on it, I was doing a lot of stuff. That wasn't okay. my first DC work, but it was uh, it was the milestone. Yeah, um, I had I can't remember all the books. I had um, not a lot. I my first DC story was a, um, a speedy story. You know, Green Arrow's pal. Oh yeah, it's, it's yeah. The first story way back when. And I, I had done, you know, a lot of little stuff like that. Um, after I left Marvel and went over, I was still living in Pennsylvania. I was renting a house in the, in the Poconos. <clears throat> and, oh, I had bought a house in the Poconos, actually. It was, <laughs> yeah, it was my first house. It cost me about $25,000 or something. Wow. But it was, it was, it was a mobile home that, Somebody, somebody had converted. They put a porch on it, and they put a side bedroom on it. And then, it, so yeah. it was like it sounds just like a lot of houses in Mississippi, but out in the woods. <laughs> and so, anyhow, that's where I was when I finished the Beowulf and started started getting more work from DC. I had worked for I had done a lot of work for First Comics, doing the Warp and and a few other things, and. Uh, And Kenzie when, I, when I, says, Pennsylvania love. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I, actually, yeah. I, Pennsylvania was great for me. It's close enough to New York. Um, I didn't care for winter. And I didn't care for <laughs> shoveling snow. And uh, what was, where were I going with that? Mike, Mike Barr's Son of Demon. Mike Barr's Son of Demon. Well, before that, um, you know, I, that's where I was living when I signed the contract for that. Yeah. And while I was working on that book, that's when I decided to move to California because in the back of my mind at that point, <clears throat> I was going to work in movies. I, I could see, I could see the end of my comic book career ahead of mm, me. Wow. Um, I don't know how old I was. Oh, uh, we lost, we lost and, Tommy. Yeah. yeah, we lost Tommy. <laughs> 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 yeah. So I, I kind of always knew that there was a time limit to my career in comics because I could see the lives of the people who came before me, mm -hmm. the way they treated people like Herb Trim and, and people like right. Gene Cole and all these guys who I grew up in love with, who created Marvel comics and they were being kicked to the curb. Yeah. And I, and I said, there is a, there is a ticking clock on this career. And that's my Paperback paintings weren't jumping off the shelves of people. So, so I, but I was interested in making movies at some point along the way, and I knew I, that's what I wanted to do. <clears throat> and but in the meantime, I'm still working in comics when I moved across country, and, and so I was working on *The Son of the Demon* while I was there, and uh, spent a lot of time working on it. A year, a year and a half. My my contract was. I made sure I had plenty of room in the contract. I said yeah. a year and a half, but Mike was behind on, um, not behind. I know he was, he had his own schedule, but by the time I received the plot, it was already a year since I signed the contract. Wow. And so, and so I was already hearing notes of pressure from the people a couple of the people at DC <clears throat> and, and I had, and I had to tell them, I said, it, it was a year from when I received, see the script. Right. Mm. And, Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay, but you know, don't, don't sit on it too long. I'm, I'm working on it every day. In right. the meantime, they're giving me comic book covers to do. I did suicide squad covers. I did uh, detective covers. I did, I did a lot of covers while I was doing the same thing. Yeah, um, and when I first moved to California, and uh, and trying to dip my toe in the movie business, I had done the one movie adaptation for a comic uh, for 
uh, a one shot called Outer Heat. I bet you don't know the movie Outer Heat. It was renamed no. to Alien Nation. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Cool. And, and, and I knew Marty Pasco. We were part, we had a little poker group there in Los Angeles. And Marty Pasco knew the writer, uh, Dan O'Bannon, a rock, rock me O'Bannon. <clears throat> and uh, so uh, I did that while I was there. And which was, and it was one of those jobs that, it's like so many Hollywood jobs. You just, <laughs> it's not the reason I'm bald. It's the reason <laughs> it's because, you know, you go in to meet the execs, you know, and you, it gives, you're doing the, the, the adaptation. So not, you're meeting, not meeting the execs, you're meeting the art director and people involved in the film. And you sign this non-disclosure agreement, of course. But then, <clears throat> well, we can't let you take any of the materials. I said, what do you mean you can't, I, well, I can't see what any of this looks like? They, they let me look through slides in the office. I'm looking at this slide projector. I don't have a slide projector at home, but I'm looking <laughs> at slides on, on their, with their projector. And I, I had this knew the script at this point. And so I'm, I'm, I had to look through like a couple hundred slides that afternoon, sitting in the studio offices, trying to pick for them to make stills for me. And I was only allowed to make so many like maybe 20 stills of the entire movie. <laughs> and so I was picking, uh, anyhow, so this is what I went home with. I, I was sent home with the, with about 20 stills and maybe about 30 slides they took, let me take home with the promise wow. that I would never let anybody see these. So help me God and, you know, right. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so I worked on this comic, the, the, the entire movie adaptation, with these little slides taped to my overhead light because I didn't have a slide projector. <laughs> and I didn't think I could afford one at that time. <laughs> so I've got, you know, these stills over here, oh, I taped on the darn board and I got the slides, taped them overhead light and then got a magnifying glass and I'm drawn. And so I did that whole book like that. <laughs> and somebody liked it. I actually, at, at one of the poker games, uh, Marty Pasco said to me, uh, you know, you know, he, he showed the book to Rockney, the writer, and he said, this looks better than the movie. <laughs> 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 got a nice pad on the back from somebody, and it was the writer of the movie, Alien Nation. That was such a cool, that's such a cool thing for me then. Wow, that is and, cool. Uh, yeah, and uh, the, what else? Uh, I'm trying that. to think of that's cool. where else I was going along those lines. Um, Th is it? Didn't you go to Disney Imagineering at, at some point? Is that? Yes, yes, I did. They had uh, they had an opening in Imagineering for there were. It was a brand new facility that was not going to be in the park. It was going to be outside the park, Pleasure Island area, for, which I've never been to, mm. <laughs> so I don't know where it's at. It was called <laughs> Disney Quest, and it was a brand new facility. I, and um, they were they were working on a ride called or an attraction, what it, everything was, the whole facility was built around computer generated games and yeah. little, little attractions, things like that. And so <clears throat> they had, um, the reason I got the job, they had Len Wein to write this ride called Ride the Comics. And it was, a matter, it was the conceit was you put on these uh, virtual reality headsets and you sat in the chair and the chair would vibrate and whatever, and the story would play out, and you would fly in and out of comic book pages, oh. <laughs> and and the bad guys, you know, they may be trying to climb over into your little space car there and attack you with hammers or whatever, and you would fight them off with uh, your virtual reality sword, and and so anyhow, the reason I got the job there was Len Wein and this ride the comics, and. Uh, at some point, well, actually, when we first started there, they didn't have many artists working on this attraction. They had like two guys in house, two illustrators in house, but most of it was coming from artists that they would just, you know, pull it off the street. Can you draw something look like Star Wars? <laughs> <laughs> so, and it was all, it's all very blue sky at that, at that time. Yeah. Nothing was in stone. Um, they had one attraction. They had the rights to do a Star Wars themed space shuttle deal, 
and then they had to write the comics they were working on and they had a couple other things. But um, I started there and the first meeting we had, uh, the guy who was heading the project, <clears throat> he, he said to us, would you rather work at home? You can work from home or you can work in the office. Well, I knew from experience that it's easier to keep working if you're working in the office. When they can see hey, you every yeah, day, uh -huh. when they see your pencil moving, when they see you turning out product and see how hard you're working, you're more likely for them to push the next thing onto your desk. Yes. And I knew that going in. And I said, well, if, you, if you've got room here, set me up. I'm, I'll, I'll work here. It was two-hour ride in rush hour traffic each way to my house. <laughs> so it was a real decision. But uh, – Len chose to work at home, and at some point, they had a problem, and I guess he, he just, they just they didn't see the, the, the output he was doing. I had no idea what he was working on after a certain point, because I was, after a week there, and with my ear to the cubicle wall, <laughs> I would hear the producers complaining about You've got nobody, you know, nobody's giving us what we want here. We've got this space deal, the alien invasion thing, and we, nobody's can paint what, what we have. And so I went home that weekend, and without telling anybody, I did two acrylic paintings of this spaceship being attacked by these monsters and aliens. And I went in there Monday morning, and I laid it on the art director's desk. Uh, not the art director's, but, my, but the project head's desk. And... And he looked at him and he left the room and he came back and he said, we'd like to make you art director of attractions. And so, yeah, that was, and this is called, that's called watching that brass ring come around. And when you <laughs> see it, you can't, you can't let it go by. Wow. You, you gotta, re, you gotta throw yourself at it, you know? And that's yeah. what I did. Yeah, I was brought in with ride the comics, and after a week, I was working on twenty-eight different attractions simultaneously. Good oh my grief! God. It's amazing. Yeah. And so, we, when we when I mentioned before about putting in fourteen-hour days, seven days a week, month after month, without a day off, and I was doing ten to fourteen hours a day, not counting two hours there and back each way in a, under LA traffic. Good wow. grief! So, yeah, that was. I'm surprised I didn't walk away with an ulcer. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. What What was the year that you were doing that? Um. What was the year? I have I have some notes I've written down over here. Hang on. 1995. Okay. Right after Malibu. Yeah, I was going to say this is after the right Malibu. Right after Malibu. Wow. Well, was it after Malibu or before Malibu? 95 um, would have been after. 95 is after. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So it was, it was around 95 ish. So yeah, that's that's uh, when when someone people ask you, well, what did you do and with our with your artwork with your illustration? I said, you cannot name a thing I have not done with my artwork. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you go after comics anywhere I could? Right, <laughs> some of the attractions that you uh, you did designs for and stuff. What's that? What were some of the attractions that you did oh. uh, designs for? Everything in Disney Quest. There were it was a four okay. story building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we're here in Orlando. Where they did they ever do a Disney Quest there in California? It was just the one here, right? In well, Orlando. they did one in Chicago, and they did one. I That's they right. Did one in over overseas, but they failed real quick because the one the one, one in Chicago, where do you park? They hit downtown Chicago, uh -huh. in, in, you know, amid the high rises and. With a Chicago winter, nobody's going to want to stand outside in line for an hour to get into a building. And that, so basically, you know, there was this poor planning on somebody's part. It collapsed fairly quickly. And the Disney Quest went on the longest, the one in Florida. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. things, you know, it was just outside Disneyland or Disney World. So, yeah, it was in the, uh, the, the downtown Disney area. Yeah. yeah. I wish I could have seen it while it was still open. I know it's closed now, but uh, yeah, they built a basketball thing in it that's now uh, not doing very well. That's it would, what it would have been nice when they when they put the thing together if they given up, given us some of us a trip out there. Because after I after I'd worked on the attraction side of things for two years, and the hell of two years, 
<clears throat> when a project like this is going on, it's a brand new facility. Nobody knows what it's going to look like when they start up. That's when I started there. And they, they kept coming, they'd come up with a new something and you'd work on it, it designs for it. And then something else would come across your desk. Well, the, they're working on development for this dinosaur. It's, it's, well, no, it was virtual jungle cruise. And what it was, it, they had, I can go in, I can take me hours to describe this stuff. <laughs> it, it was every, there was a cube, there's a large cubicle and they had these very large airbags that were computer controlled. And you had a rubber raft, a four person rubber raft on top of these airbags. And there was a screen in front. Yeah. And what it would, you, it, you ride down the river and it was called virtual jungle cruise. And when he told me about, they explained me, explained to me the ride. I said, why make a jungle cruise? Why not make it a dinosaur cruise? And because I was, I was looking at Dinotopia at the time, the James Gurney stuff, which is you know, incredible artwork. But <clears throat> I had, you know, it was only a couple months before I picked up that book. So when they said jungle cruise, I said, make it a kids would rather see dinosaurs. Yeah. That's how I put it. And that, and basically I swung everybody's opinion. Yeah. Hey, we should make it. Why not make it a, you know, you know what, Cretaceous cruise is what I called it. I don't know what it wound up being called. Did they end up converting it to a, uh, they did something like that in there. Cause we wrote it. It was a, yes, did it was, they convert to a pirate's ride. Didn't they convert it into a pirate thing too? They, they had some other, little overlays for it. Didn't they? I don't know if the pirate ride is the same thing. Cause I remember working on a pirate ride as well. Yeah. But, uh, I know, I know the, the dinosaur raft ride. Uh, Philip says there was one in Houston. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Phil. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the, what, I know the dinosaur one got me because that was one of the most popular attractions. And, uh, and I also, you know, God, I did so much there. There was a, wild ducks hockey thing it was, it was basically cartoon duck. i was drawing everything i said from spaceships to cartoon ducks to aladdin stuff to jurassic cruise i was doing all this stuff and we had uh they had come up with a bumper car deal right and they didn't know how it was going to be designed but it was that was going to be the pirate thing there were cannons on the front of these bumper cars. And yeah, they, that's right. What, the, like volleyballs or something? And if you hit, and on the side of these bumper cars, there was, there was a, like an X. And if you hit it in the right spot, you could spin the other guy's car. And they took me over and they showed me, you know, the mechanics inside the car before it was built. And I had to design a body for these cars. And so I, I basically, somebody else, I, I can't take credit for the con con concept, but right. it was kind of themed, kind of Jetson. And so I took that idea and I created, it was difficult to craft these cars because, you know, as designing as I wanted to make them creatively, there were limitations because you couldn't have fins sticking out where bumper cars would hit. You had you couldn't have anything that stuck further out. Fr everything was measured to the inch, you know. So if you had little little bits of design stuff that was crafted onto the mobile, you know, it would it would interfere. And of course, everything had to be solid because you're being hit with these volleyballs that coming out of cannons. And so, <clears throat> anyhow, that was another popular popular thing from what they told me. So um, I got the thing here. Mackenzie Wortman is joining I'm us busy. for the very oh, first right. time. Mackenzie, you're, you're muted, Mackenzie. Mac there you go. Sorry. There we go. There we go. <laughs> okay. Did you want me to share art, by the way? Uh, yeah. Why don't you go ahead and share uh, art? So, uh, so as uh, so, a really quick introduction here, Jerry. Uh, Mackenzie oh. is uh, writing an upcoming. Uh, series for us nice so yeah and i have been on her for ever let's just say weeks and weeks to join us and so uh, she's, she's first joining us so she gets to join us with the jerry bingham stream 
Oh, nice to meet you. Yeah. Andrew. Nice to meet you. Uh, All right, so we, we so and anyway, to finish up the Disney thing, um, I don't know, finish up. I could I do this for months. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't because we got another question. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, they did no the Disney then to wrap up the Disney thing. I was after over two years working on 28 different attractions. Um, me and then I would I hired out side a couple a couple other illustrators to come in to you know as I would art direct and I couldn't do all the art for all of them and the initial stages the first year in the project when nobody knew what was happening just imagine me and a couple other guys working our cans off in our cubicles creating as much art as we could possibly create in the space of a week so that Monday morning the art would go on display boards to have the bean counters meeting with the, with, oh. with all the, the heads of uh, Imagineering. You had Eisner and Ovitz and all these guys would come around and sit around and I was never allowed in the meetings because it had to be the top guys who explained everything to them. <clears throat> but uh, they would explain stuff and then they would come back to me after the meeting and they would say, no. Well, <laughs> we would like you, you know, we don't want this to be pirates. We want to change that to cavemen. So, okay. So I would sit there for the next week and redesign everything top to bottom. And I did this for almost a full year, just meeting after every week, a meeting with the big shots and just redesigning everything. I throw away everything you've done last week and start again over and over and over again. And that, that takes something out of you. <laughs> Wow, I can only, I can only imagine. imagine. Yeah, but at the end of it was, where I was going with this was at the end of uh, two years. Um, at some point, the the head of the project came by and said, "Jerry, we're kind of <clears throat> we're putting the finishing touches on these attractions, on the on these rides, whatever. Um, we, we, you know, you know, we have the facility we have to work on. We are working on. They had four floors of the of the facility." Was it four floors or five? Four floors of the facility. Yeah. Huh? yeah, four floors. They had three of the top designers in the country, in architectural designers in the country, working on three of the floors, and they did not have one for the fourth floor. He said, can you read a blueprint? And I, and I said, sure, I can read a blueprint. <laughs> <laughs> so on my way home that night, <laughs> I stopped at the art. I stopped at the art store and bought myself an architect, architect's ruler. And I went in there early the next morning. And I went back to where the architects worked in the back of the shop. And I said, "Could you explain some of this stuff to me?" And <laughs> the one, you know, the one guy who was a great guy. I owe him so much. He actually he had the blue this big blueprint laid out on the table for one Florida building, and he said, "Here's where." The height of the door frame. Here's where how many steps and how deep each step has to be. And we have to have the handicap ramp and we have to do that. And this is where the size of this is. And he showed and he showed me how it was written out and labeled all over the blueprints. And I went back to my my cubicle and I looked at my architect's rule and I cried. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just actually I uh I just sat down and what I was, I just started designing where the attractions would flit would fit onto this floor because I knew the footprint of the attraction itself. I knew the size of what they were putting, you know, the, the box that the rafts were in. I knew what, how close to a wall something had to be. And so when I took, took up the blueprint and I, and I had it to the side, I had my other artwork spread out. So I knew what was going on to that floor. And I started doing, I had never done architectural rendering, <laughs> but you know, it, it's, it's, it's one of those things. You just do it. You, you get on, you know, there is no fear. You go in, what can I say? You're, you're fired. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. and, but they weren't going to do that. I knew I had, at some point my boss came by and said, Jerry, you're doing the work of three people here. So I, I knew I had them on my side for the most part, if I could pull it off. And so yeah. I, I designed this this floor and where all these attractions fit. It was the explore zone. So I had the dinosaur floor, and there was a there was a balcony that went around. We had Aladdin up there on the balcony, and yeah. 
and I, I, I'm, I'm visualizing because I've, I've we I, went I, I, a times because, when we first moved down here. Tommy, because I was there, I never saw the finished product. I don't know what I designed actually made it onto the walls, but I I did the, the preliminary paintings for. I don't know. There should have been one wall up there that morphs from Aladdin into Hercules. There was there was. Uh, I'm like, trying to remember. Yeah. Remember you had the funky, the bottom floor that that got you into the building. That was right. really weird. Uh, uh, well, I remember one of the floors had like video games just everywhere. There was another floor that had like what you were saying. They had the. Uh, the Aladdin stuff and all that kind of stuff. And it, was, it was Aladdin, Hercules, the dinosaur thing. I think so. And, yeah, yeah. In a, in a virtual roller coaster kind of a thing. Was, was it there? Was a, there was supposed to also be. It was supposed to be like an Indiana Jones thing where there were remote control jeeps. Yeah, and no, was like a whole section where yeah, you got to see a little screen, right. and then you could see the glass floor where the little jeeps were running around yeah, underneath I, the floor and stuff. Well, I, I had to design that to fit in. Oh, that was your fault, the reason why we kept running into the walls and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> it's my fault. Yeah, exactly. Well, there, there was supposed to fit underneath this pyramid. Was there a heavy yeah, pyramid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It worked out. It was yeah, fun. It, it was a fun mezzanine. And, you could, and this, this track was actually underneath the py pyramid, the way I yeah. do that. Yeah, the floor. You could see through the floor. and You could see the little cars. So you would... Like I my wife and I would go, I'd be driving around, and I said, "The car's over there on the corner." She'd probably see the car going around. Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah, I created. I created that maze. Yeah, each had like a little camera on it or something like that, so you could see what was going on. There was there was something I know did not make it. That was it was the real shame. They wanted a cool way to get from the mezzanine to the ground floor, uh, and we had um, the Aladdin where the pyramid was that went down to the. Uh, Remote control jeeps, but uh, if you went along from Aladdin, you went to the Hercules side of the building, and it was the Hercules cartoon, right? And so I had the trees at that end designed the way they were designed in the cartoon. Very, um, I forget the name of the artist who was inspired that's part of it, but they were very designy. <laughs> and but the way the cool way that I came up with to get down from the balcony to the bottom was the Hydra slide. And what it was, it was a tube that came off of the Hercules side of the, the mezzanine down to the ground floor, and it was a Hydra head that the kids would come out of the mouth. <laughs> I actually, don't remember that. No, that was, that was canceled after oh. so much work was done on it um, because coming down this slide, the space they had to work with, kids were coming down pretty fast. <laughs> Theoretically, because it wasn't ever made. But at the bottom of the slide, they had to have a soft sculpt down there so the kids that had something to run, to bang into when they got the, got down the slide. And I, I created the, the soft sculpt for me was Hades from the Hercules movie. Hades and his two little minions there with, with the red glowing lights and everything. So these kids are coming down into hell, basically, when they yeah. came out of the And well, I, I think Michael Eisner didn't care for that. <laughs> it was a little too scary for the little kids. And I, I, I guess I can understand that. But at the time, I put so much work into it, and I was so proud of it. <laughs> Jerry, we've got a question from InfraFran here who says, <laughs> what was your initial reaction when you found that recognition by receiving your own title at D.C.? And when did you finally realize Marvel wasn't going to play? Uh, well, the, the Marvel play thing. Yeah, that was, um, I don't know what year it was. But you, you look it up by seeing when I did all those team-ups and two-in-ones. Because mm -hmm. then I was, I was just being, I was being passed from one editor to the other. And at the, t at the time, and one of the reasons that bothered me so much was <clears throat> Jim Shooter had instituted this policy where if you were if you stayed on a book for six issues in a row, you got a bonus check, and oh. and so that's another incentive to stay on a book, despite just wanting to make a, a character my own. <clears throat> but it seemed like I would do three books over here, and then they send me off, and I do two over here, and they send me back, and I do a two or three or four over here, and I never got six issues in a row. <laughs> and at, oh. that, at that point, I, I was kind of. 
my ego got the better of me, I guess. And I said, yeah, that's when I said, I, I got to go, go check out DC. And yeah. the DC stuff took over. Yeah, took over sense. my life for quite a few years there. Um, also says, uh, can I ask about his work on Tron? So there's not a specific oh. thing there. So in the movie, um, I, I had worked, mo most of my storyboard work was for special effects companies and uh, special effects and um, title sequences. And so Tron was a, a title sequence that I had done some storyboarding for. Um, I, was, I was never, <clears throat> I very seldom got my name in the credits because you have to be union for most of these and <clears throat> I was never in a union. I was working for, they said I was working for a third party signatory being working for the special effects companies. Therefore, I was not uh, eligible to get union status for all those years. So wow. something, another big complaint of mine that I won't go into detail on because I wanted to do well, I've never heard of that. Wow. <laughs> so, well, yeah. so let me ask, so here's a question uh, for you. All, all these storyboards that you uh, that you did for this, do you, ha do you have those? Or, 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 I have a lot of them. Yeah. What's that? I have a lot of them. Okay. Um, I posted, I started posting some of them when I was back, back in my Facebook days. And I actually had uh, the boss at one of the companies telling me that, uh, Jerry, you can't be posting all this stuff. You signed a, a non-disclosure agreement and, and the companies we work for will not like this. And so basically, I, the, one of the reasons I left Hollywood ultimately is because I had my name on nothing. I couldn't even open my portfolio to show other people to get work. I was getting a lot of work from these couple, from these few companies that knew me. And, and so, you know, I was never really without work, but the fact that I could not, you know, it was always a week here, two weeks there, bounce here, bounce there. I mm. couldn't get uh, the union benefits, you know, the medical or where. And so <clears throat> eventually I, I went in one year, I was at the one company for, what was it? <sighs> over you know, 10 years maybe wow and I, I went in and asked, asked for a raise one day and the boss said well we can't quantify your value to these projects because we have so many people working on these projects we can't oh my your gosh. Value. And, and after all my years there when he said that and that's in the back of my mind i said i'm done and i think i put yeah. in another year after that but that's when i left out of you wow I couldn't get in a union. I couldn't show my, my portfolio to anybody. And so, yeah, that's, that's, that's frustrating. <laughs> I go from one tragic story to the next. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm over it. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> I'm over it. Can I, can I ask is that the, the, the hypocrisy of the whole thing, or is that a calculated move on studios t to keep people kind of, locked into working for them and not going to work for a competitor or well they they, they have uh you know these these companies the, the but you know they're the biggest company some of the biggest companies that were doing these titles and and such um they have a lot of ours to choose from yeah they kept coming back to me though and they had certain projects like uh Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movies and, you know, the, the couple of companies, the one company that was working on that, he really wanted me back to do the storyboarding on those because of my comic book background, of course. Right. But uh, at that time, I was already out. I was, uh, I was done with it all. So, hmm. um, I, I started, I started with the one company. I never wanted to do storyboards. Never. It's a grueling, thankless job. And I knew this before I started. Um, I started as, uh, as a production illustrator. I actually went to UCLA to study production design. That was my ultimate goal, uh, become a production designer. Um, but I was working as an illus a production illustrator, and my first job I got from Malibu. Thank you, Malibu, for that. I was, uh, <laughs> I was in the Malibu offices, and I forget who came by. Maybe it was... Uh, Maybe it was your boss there. Somebody came by and said, they're looking for, Wes Craven is looking for probably an artist. He knew, he knew somebody at the company, probably your boss. Chris probably, yeah. yeah. 
and he was looking for somebody to work on his new nightmare. He had a new Freddy movie he was working on. <clears throat> and I said, me, me, me. So, and so <laughs> I, I'm in the appointment and I went over and Wes Craven was my first director that I actually worked, worked with side by side. And he's the, he was the best. I, I, I was so sad to see him pass. He he was, when I first, the first day I walked into his office, I never walked into a director's office before, never. <laughs> so the first day I walked into his office and <clears throat> he's a red flannel shirt, torn blue jeans, dirty sneakers propped up on his desk and take a chair and started talking to me about stuff. Said, oh, cool. How cool is this? This is movies. Why haven't I been doing this forever? <laughs> and so, yeah, he was, he was the, he was the first and the best. And he liked, he obviously liked what I did on his, on his Freddy Krueger. Um, I designed new ba makeup for the guy. Uh, they went from being the burn scars to basically it was, you know, the idea was Freddy's claws are real claws because he's in hell. This is the devil, Freddy. And so I had just watched and because I had just watched uh, the Johnny Depp movie, Scissor Hands. Really, yeah. Scissor Hands, yeah. And, and so I was inspired by the fact that Johnny Depp didn't have these gaping wounds. He had like scars on his face because, you know, it was the ac accidental, you know, as he's growing used to his claws or whatever, he created these scars all over. And so I took that conceit to Freddie, who was basically a psychopath who would probably scratch his face on purpose purpose. <laughs> so he wound up with all these big gaping wounds on his face with muscle and sinew showing through. And I took the drawings into West and said, perfect. I love it. And that's what they did with that. Wow. <laughs> and so, and then when Wes went on to do his next movie, Vampire in Brooklyn, he asked me over onto that one. And yeah. I, I designed the makeup. I never got credit for it. So the makeup department did. But I designed the makeup and I designed a lot of props for that movie. And uh, that was, for me, that's what I, that, that was great. Mm -hmm. Before I could become a production designer, I just wanted to do that forever. And then I went over to, I got picked up at Digital Roman Domain because I knew a couple writers who were working over there with their project. And I was there for over a year. The, and the writers, you know, they're very famous writers. I'm not going to say their name. But they're, they're a very famous writing duo who basically you would know every movie they were on and yeah. Joe Bruckheimer and, you know, to Disney or whatever. And these guys are, are just phenomenons in the, in the industry. And I knew the one guy from the poker games. <laughs> and, he, yeah. and, he, and he told me that they were looking for somebody to do some pre-production art to sell their project. You know, so so digital main could sell a project to the executives at the other these other companies, and so they the these writers had the money they paid for paid for my time out of their own pocket. Wow! For nearly, for nearly a year, and I was making Disney money. Right I was making a lot of dough back then, <laughs> and so and, and so God bless them. You know, they they liked my stuff enough to keep me around, and at certain, some point, I was working on four different movies at the same time for them. Doing great concept art, paint, paintings to storyboards. I was doing everything that they needed to sell their project to. Um, and Morgan Freeman was in one day. The Rock was in. They had all these celebrities coming in to these pitch meetings to get their studios on board for these movie projects that never got made. Wow. <laughs> With the sin of it. After all that work and, and all the struggle and, and trying to make stuff perfect, you can still get stuff canceled in Hollywood. Yeah. Easily, easier than getting it made. So, I was gonna say, I, I would, I would be willing to guess if it was just a guess on mine that there's probably more not made than there are yes. made out there. Oh, yeah, of course, mm -hmm. of course. There was, I actually, while I was there, I was working, I was doing some stuff outside the studio, but Digital Main had control of some special effects sequences and that sort of thing. So I was doing some stuff for Secondhand Lions. You know that movie? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I love that movie. Yeah. And so, but I got to work on several, you know, important scenes on that movie while I was working on these four other movies at the same time. <laughs> wow, that's pretty cool. But you know, 
it's, it's pretty cool when you look back and, and you think about all the stuff you've done in your life. At the time, you're just thinking how tired you are, David. Right. <laughs> you're thinking about the drive the next day, going into the office. You're thinking about, you know, is, is, am I going to get carpal tunnel? Is my hand going to fall off? Yeah. <laughs> am I going to go blind? <laughs> so, but nobody can say I didn't work hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Whether it was good or not. You know. <laughs> Anyhow, no. so that was, uh, so, and then after Digital Domain, that's when I uh, I got a call from this Ewan company, it was this title, titles company, because they were doing the Hulk movie, the first Ang Lee, Ang Lee. Hulk, and they were doing the opening sequence on Ang Lee's Hulk, and they needed somebody who could draw comic books, and there I was. <laughs> Yeah. What do you need to do? Well, we need somebody to storyboard the opening sequences and all. And I, I said, okay. And that weekend I went and sat in the, the big chair in Barnes and Noble with all the storyboard books in front of me, reading them cover to cover <laughs> days so that when I went in Monday morning, I knew what I was doing when I, when I started drawing and stuff. <laughs> That's yep. my whole life. And yep. I remember, okay, this, <laughs> I have so many segues. I don't know how to fit them on it. <laughs> well, we'll just have to invite you back for another one. Yeah, it was well something unrelated that I remembered, and I've heard it from other people as well. The, the, the same anecdote, you know. I for a while, you know, I was thinking well, maybe I can be a director, and so hmm. I I wanted to learn the other jobs too. I was just I just finished the production design class, and so I said, well, if, if I'm gonna be a director, what else can I try to do? And so I said, okay, I'm gonna take acting classes. <laughs> but but you know, I was petrified every I, every time I got on stage. I would I would feel like everybody could see me sweat. <laughs> it's, I couldn't. I was ne I, like I said when we were talking earlier, me talking in front of an audience. But yeah. Um. Anyhow, the one thing, two things I took away from that that class, uh, that teacher. She's a, she's a great teacher. She came from the London stage. She taught me how to read Shakespeare and understand it. Mm. And she and she told me the other thing she told me was if a director said whatever the director asks you, you can do. If a director says, Can you ride a horse? You say yes, I can ride a horse, and then you go home and learn how to ride a horse. Yeah. yeah. Never say no, I don't know. <laughs> and I took yeah. that away from that class to almost every job I had after that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I go to the store. I didn't even buy the storyboard books. I just sat there and read the new store. <laughs> <laughs> the employees <laughs> giving you the stink eye, right? What's that? The employees all giving you the stink eye. He's been sitting there yeah, for three no, hours. Always hot coffee. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that and so that's that's how I got into storyboarding was with you and company and Angley, and then I was. He kept hiring me for the next 10 years and his partner that had split off and started his own company, he called me over and I started working for him and I worked for half a dozen different companies like that without yeah. ever getting into a union, which, wow. which was, which was, I call it Bingham's Bane. I anything good at this point. My, my father, you know, I belong to three unions, the fire firemen's union, the electrician's union. The I, I said, dad, it doesn't, I can, I can maybe talk to some, no dad, you can't talk to anybody in Hollywood. You're not going to, yeah. <laughs> he, he really wanted to help. <laughs> yeah. But <clears throat> yeah, it was uh, a lot, a lot of storyboard jobs after that for, for a guy who never wanted to draw storyboards, but that's where, <laughs> I, could make, that's where I could make money. Yeah. You know. Well, I think it's always interesting to hear how you, you got a plan to do one thing and then uh, sometimes life uh, sends you in another direction. Like I said, you just have to be ready for it when it happens. Yep. You know, or, and if you're not ready, be able to jump on the horse real quick. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, like I said, well, going, kind of going from comic books and not knowing where I was going to end up in Hollywood if I was going to do anything. I knew where I wanted to do, but I never really got to do it. Yeah. Well, believe it or not, Jerry, our uh, our time has flown by, and we have been. Uh, uh, would you believe we've been doing this for almost two hours? Can you believe that? Uh, yeah, I need to pass out. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So uh, anybody else there got a quick question for me or anything that you want? I, to I just want I just want to say uh, about Jerry and Roland. I talk talk about you. You know, even when we're we're not on the show. You know, hands down, <laughs> yes, that's one of my one of my favorite Batman artists of all time. Yeah, um, Son of Demon, mm -hmm. one of the best books, and Talia Al Ghul never looked better than when you drew her, and and um, definitely I think one of the things that I've always loved about your art is how solid, consistent, and thorough it is, which is something that you just don't see a lot nowadays. You you are a, a true illustrator, through and through, and that's so rare, and it's rare and rare as time goes on, and 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 I think it's timeless. Yeah. I think I think you're you're hands down one of the best um comic graphs i know so um and for everybody that worked in malibu you know i know you said you were only there one day a week but i think you influenced everybody that had any any inclination for art and and improved everybody so i just had to had to had to say that and hope everybody that's watching well, well you know to, to that to that point you know as, as good as you thought i was and i never thought i was very good but that feeling that i was never very good is how i got to where i am now yeah. Because I was never satisfied with anything I did. <laughs> and regardless of what anybody else said, I could see the fault in my own work. And so I was always looking for inspiration from somewhere else. And when I, when I, when I teach you know, the occasional workshop now, I have to tell people, yeah, you, all you ever want to do in life is draw comic books. But trust me, if you take a photography class and learn to develop your own photos, you will learn stuff from the lighting and the shadowing on those photos. If you yes. sculpt, you will learn how to see things in 3D. Whatever you do artistically should inspire what you are working on now and yeah. try to just yank every bit of information you can out of all those little tasks. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's, well, I gotta it, say, that's how I got yeah. that's how I got to where I am, however little fame I've got. So yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that's uh, I think that's absolutely good advice. Um, any, anybody else? Oh, any, yeah, I wanted, I wanted to say, yeah, it's just so inspiring to see your work ethic, your dedication, your, your knowledge. And then just the fact that you're able to take on any task, really. Yeah. You know, I, I really admire that because it's, it's hard to get yourself to where you say, you know, you don't have fear of not knowing how to do what you're going <laughs> to embark on. Well, somebody, yeah, somebody, I think, somebody, I think, I think it was Steve Mitchell actually, the anchor. He say, he said, when I was showing him some of the stuff I was bringing home from Disney, he said, you know, he said, Jerry, I, you may not be the the best at anything, but you're like the best middle infielder. <laughs> you can pick up a ball, <laughs> you can pick up a ball from anywhere and throw it to first base. Play any you position. Know? Yeah. So yeah. The, that's a baseball analogy for for all of you comic book geeks listening. Yeah, so um, I it was because I was never satisfied, and like I said, I was working at comics. I went over to paint paperback covers, and I went from there, you know, back to comic books, and then I went out to Hollywood. And so I was, I like I said before, I knew my time in comics was limited, so I had to be. I was almost desperately searching for my next thing. And I wasn't about to let any opportunity go by because you yeah. never know where it's going to go. Right. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. That so everybody story. leave silver line and go work in movies right now today. <laughs> <laughs> this is your future. <laughs> I want to announce the formation of my new company, Redline Comic Books. Uh, we'll Red Line. <laughs> yeah. Roland's going to hit a hit squad out after me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I I won't remind you the power I have of the button over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, so we'll go around and and uh, uh, tell folks where they can find you online. Uh, Mackenzie, don't uh, don't bail just yet, okay? Uh, Tommy, okay. where can folks find you on the interwebs? Uh, well, if, if you need anything printed, go over to Kablam Digital Printing, kablam.com. But you can find stuff about me. There you go. Um, just go to Inferno Studios. That's my dot uh, com. That's my own, uh, my own line of stuff. There's links and stuff in there, but I'm mostly on uh, Facebook. And then, uh, you just uh, do a search for Flormonte, F L O R I M O N T E. You'll find me right here on Sunday nights. 
Me in here on Sunday nights, exactly. <laughs> Mackenzie, where can people find you online? Oh, gosh. They can find me on Facebook at Mackenzie Wortman and on Instagram and Twitter at Wortman25. And I'm sure when they find you, they'll see lots of dinosaurs. And uh, we'll get you back on oh. when we're going to question you about all the dinosaurs, Mackenzie. <laughs> Okay, I'm sure you can see Raven behind me. She's uh, yeah. she's uh, a at the doctor's right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Roberta, how about you? Where, where can folks find you on the interwebs? Hi, yeah, uh, um, you can find me on Facebook and on um, Instagram under Roby Conroy, and um, you're on Silverline Sunday. That's right. And Curtis, what about you? Where can folks find you online? Sure. So I have uh, two things. I have my martial arts school that now teaches online classes. And then I have my comic book that I'm working on. So for the uh, martial arts school and all the social media is up there for it. Uh, it's tigercrane.net. And for my comic book, uh, we call it Shadow Ghost, the, the Kung Fu comic by a Kung Fu master. That's www.theshadowghost.com. So you can find me there. Is your Curtis, class still Curtis, I got to tell you, you know, I got to Tell you the respect I have for you staying with the, the martial arts and with the Kung Fu for all these years since we first met. You were thinking about it. And, you know, I got to tell you, you, you got my respect, sir. Yeah. Oh, well, that, 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 that means the world to me because you're one of the very first martial arts I talked to about it. So, so I appreciate it. You, you got it, though. All right. Uh, Curtis's year. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, you Tommy, hide from people Tommy, online. McKenzie, Curtis, Roberta, Roland, thank you guys. Absolutely. Oh, it, was it wasn't as painful as I thought it would be. Good. I didn't think it would be. So so when I send you an email and ask you back, you won't be you won't be so hesitant, right? Try to find me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is, that is of course my question for you, Jerry, because you, you you hide out from my online. If people want to find you, where can they go? You um a website. Well, my website's jerrybingham.com, real easy to figure out. All right, very cool. And I, I know because you and I have swapped some emails that uh, you haven't been in the convention scene for a while, but uh, I oh. think you're you're lining up a few, right? What's that? Yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, any, just any now, you can it's, it's, yet? Been, it's been probably what uh, ten years or more since I've been to a comic book convention. Oh, so I just this year somebody talked me into it. Uh, so are I've there, got. Uh, are there any you can announce yet? Um. Well, if I'm not going to say anything. I, I, have, uh, okay. I have an agent who's working it out. Okay. Me, so. All right. Well, once you can announce something, uh, we'll be we'll be happy to uh, get those announced uh, for you as well. And cool. uh, I am Roland. You can find me on the, uh, you can find me all over the social medias. Uh, just look for Roland Man or Manrola. And if you've seen us at all, you know what we do here at the end of our uh, show. We'd like to tell you. Oh, don't forget, uh, shout, thanks to Daytona Beach Comic Con for being our sponsor. Uh, uh, thanks to uh, Orlando Collector Deviants. Shout out to Kablam and to um, Coliseum of Comics. Um, don't forget, we have a Tuesday show. Be here. Check out those guys, uh, that Tuesday that that Silverline show on Tuesday, and then be back here Wednesday for the Whammers. But until then, remember to. Oh, hi, I'm Greg Horn. Make mine silver line.